The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Tackling the Challenge of Treating Severe Asthma, Taking Aim at the Airway Epithelium. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash MRW 860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello, I'm Professor Andrew Menzies-Gale from the Royal Brompton Hospital in London. Welcome to this educational activity on the role of epithelial alarmins in severe asthma. The first part of the activity takes you through a fun, interactive game to assess and improve your knowledge of this topic. In the presentation that follows, I will discuss the latest insights into the pathophysiology of severe asthma and the clinical implications of novel therapies targeted at epithelial alarmins in the treatment of patients with severe asthma. Severe asthma is estimated to affect approximately 10% of all patients with asthma and more than half of these patients have three or more exacerbations per year as disease severity worsens. Despite available treatment, a significant burden remains for many patients with severe uncontrolled asthma, as many have an inadequate response to biologic treatment and oral corticosteroids and fail to achieve asthma control. With this in mind, let's begin the game portion of the activity. Assess your knowledge and find out how you rank among your colleagues. You'll be presented with questions or scenarios and you'll be able to earn up to 1,600 points. You will see your points in ranking as you proceed through the game. So we know that 340 million people across the world suffer from asthma, and each one is an individual, and each one has a slightly different disease. So asthma is a very heterogeneous disease, and you can see from this slide it's a combination of the pathophysiology, the endotypes, and the phenotypes. So it's not surprising that patients respond differently to different treatments. And we should always bear that in mind when we're making a decision about how best to treat our patients. If we think about the immunology of asthma, we've really moved our understanding forward in the last couple of years. And we really recognize the importance of the airway epithelium. The airway epithelium protects our lungs from attack. And that may be by viral infections. It might be by allergens. It may be by cigarette smoke or pollution or bacterial infections. But it's our first barrier. And we know that the airway epithelium produces alarming so epithelial derived cytokines that drive asthma and inflammation from the top of the inflammatory cascade and there are three key cytokines to think about thymic stromal lymphopoietin tsrp il25 and il33 and you can see from this cartoon on the right that if we look at tsrp it very much drives the classic t helper 2 type response with T helper 2 cells driving interleukin 5 to increase eosinophilia and also IL 4 to increase B cells to produce IgE and drive allergy. And we also know that in the middle of the slide, the innate immune system with the innate lymphoid cells type 2, again, TSLP driving a lot of IL 5 and IL 13 production and driving type 2 inflammation. And then on the right of the slide, where our understanding is less certain, but we think that again, epithelial derived cytokines and alarmins are driving neutrophilic inflammation via Th1 cells and Th17 cells. So if we think about asthma, we really must remember that within one individual and even within one individual at different points in time, they can have different inflammatory subtypes. So we can measure airways inflammation in lots of different ways. The easiest ways to do it are look at bloody eosinophils or measure exhaled nitric oxide because these are relatively easy tests to do. More invasive ways are looking at sputum or bronchial biopsies all have benefit. And if we look at the phenotypes that we see as a consequence, we have eosinophilic asthma, which may be allergic or non-allergic. We have in the middle a combination of eosinophilic and neutrophilic asthma. And towards the right of this slide, either porcy granulocytic or neutrophil predominant asthma, all very relevant phenotypes. And if we move that down to the endotype, that the, what's driving that phenotype, we understand that certainly eosinophilic and allergic asthma tends to be driven by type 2 high asthma, whereas we think the more porcy granulocytic and neutrophilic inflammation is driven by type 2 low asthma. But there's a lot we don't know. And I think within an individual patient, we must remember that both of these endotypes might be present and they might have more than one phenotype, either at the same time or over a period of time, depending on what they're being exposed to. So I think it's very easy for us to imagine now that we have five available biologics that we are treating severe asthma very well and that we can really congratulate ourselves and move on. But there's an ongoing significant burden. I think that's really very important to remember that many patients with severe asthma don't have that super responder response that we're looking for to the first biologic. 
And many patients still are needing either recurrent bursts or even maintenance oral corticosteroids and not achieving control despite being on a biologic. And if we look at the group mean data from those phase three pivotal studies looking at the biologics for anti-IgE, anti-L5 and anti-L5 receptor alpha, and now anti-L4 receptor alpha, we're seeing about an overall 50% reduction in analyzed asthma exacerbations. That hides some super responders who do very well and don't exacerbate at all, and others who are continuing to exacerbate at exactly the same rate as they were pre-biologic, and some in the middle who've had a partial response. So why is that? It's not that the biologics aren't good. They are fantastic drugs for the right patients, but for some, they may be too selective. These are downstream molecules that are taking out one or two parts of the inflammatory pathway, and it may explain why they work for some exacerbations, but not all exacerbations, because people can have exacerbations due to type 2 inflammation or potentially non-type 2 inflammation in an individual person. And obviously, at a broader level, multiple different pathways may be involved. And we know that type 2 inflammation is resulting from lots of inflammatory signals, as well as interleukin-5. So for instance, many of our patients are allergic, as well as eosinophilic, and they may have a strong peripheral blood eosinophil signal, but also a high nitric oxide level, suggesting they've got IL-13 driven inflammation as well. And anti-IL-5 treatment or anti-IL-5 receptor alpha treatment clearly will target the eosinophil, but it won't treat the allergy and it won't treat that IL-13 component as well. So I think there's still a need for more biologics and potentially for targeting upstream. So in terms of targeting upstream, we see that the inflammatory response involving IL-4, IL-5 and IL-13 that gives us our classic features of asthma. So eosinophilic inflammation, that mucus production, the bronchospasm, is really due to the alarm in those epithelial-derived cytokines, TSLP, IL-33 and IL-25, for a variety of triggers, including viral infections, bacterial infections, pollution, allergens. So that's really the upstream mediators driving that downstream IL-4, 5 and 13 inflammation. So if we think about the role of the airway epithelium in a little bit more detail, and those of you that have done the quiz, you'll remember this question. So clearly the airway epithelium is acting as a barrier. It's a physical barrier, which is a protection, and it can become damaged, certainly become damaged in asthma, and then decrease that physical barrier. And it's also the environmental sensor. It's protecting us from everything that we're breathing in that we've just talked about. It's really important in mediating immunity because it induces inflammation. So it's driving both the innate and adaptive immune responses. And if we think, and those of you that have done the quiz, this is just a reminder of the right answers. So clearly the airway epithelium is acting as a barrier. It's a physical barrier. It's also sensing the environment, and then it's triggering inflammation when required. So it's mediating immunity. It's driving both an innate and adaptive immune response. And for many years, we focused on adaptive immunity with T cells and B cells, and forgetting that it's the innate immune response that keeps us alive all of the time because our adaptive immunity takes a while to develop but innate immunity is there and immediately available now we know that that airway epithelium when it becomes under attack and becomes damaged it leads to the production of epithelial cytokines these alarmings which can then activate airway inflammation and we think it may be driving structural changes and it might be a starting point for airway remodeling and that makes a lot of sense because for all the reasons we're saying it's that barrier it's what signals to the underlying airway parenchyma and the airway smooth muscle if it's coming under attack in terms of asthma pathophysiology, we've been very comfortable talking about T cells and B cells and T helper 2 responses for a long time. We now recognize how important innate immunity is, because if I'm blunt, that's what keeps us alive while we're waiting for our adaptive immunity to kick in. And in terms of induced inflammation, we know that these epithelial cytokines, the alarmins, can activate airway inflammation. And we think that they may drive structural changes. And they might be a starting point for airway remodeling. So that signaling that's coming from the airway epithelium can then impact on the airway parenchyma and the airway smooth muscle cells and might induce airway remodeling. So if we look in detail at the three classical epithelial alarmins, the epithelial derived cytokines, they're rapidly released after epithelial damage or immune cell activation, and they activate downstream. So they're secreted basally down into the lung parenchyma. And R33 has a large number of cellular targets and can certainly augment T helper 2 responses. TSLP, also a large number of targets, and we think drives T helper 2 responses via dendritic and T cells. IL-25, a slightly smaller number of cellular targets, and we think at the moment the immunology suggests requires R4 to drive the T helper 2 cell responses. If we think about 
the features of asthma that are associated with TSLP. Various studies, both in animal and humans, have correlated TSLP with asthma severity, with a decrease in lung function, importantly with a decreased steroid responsiveness and an exaggerated response to viral infections. So for all those reasons, it's a very logical target for us to be thinking about in treating severe asthma. So in terms of TSLP, you can see on the left is the cartoon. And again, at the top, we've got the airway epithelium coming under attack from viruses and allergens, pollution, physical injury, bacteria, etc. And we can then see TSLP being key for allergic inflammation on the left, eosinophilic inflammation in the middle, and neutrophilic inflammation in the right. And we think it's very central to the regulation of type 2 immunity, but also involved in that non-type 2 immune responses, which we're showing on the right of the cartoon. And TSLP expression is increased in the airways of patients with asthma, correlates with TH2 cytokine and chemokine expression and disease severity. And we also think it's involved in neutrophilic inflammation via TH1 and TH17. So a very logical target for the treatment of severe asthma. So in summary, I think it's really important that when we think about asthma severity, we also think about asthma control and we think about secondary factors that are leading to poor asthma control. And remember that in the individual person in front of us, there might be several subtypes of asthma existing, even at that point in time or over a period of time. So they may have some components of T2 high asthma. They may have T2 low asthma. It may be mixed. And certainly I might see them today, but if I see them in six months time when it's the middle of the winter and they're being exposed to viruses and pollution levels are higher, the relevant subtype driving symptoms, driving poor control, driving exacerbations may be different. And I think really importantly, we understand that the airway epithelium plays a critical role in asthma. And if we understand and accept that, then the logical next step is that the epithelial alarmins, such as TSLP, L33 and L25, are key epithelial derived cytokines acting upstream in the inflammatory pathway of asthma and very logical targets for us to think about as we try and improve our therapies for people with severe asthma. Okay, so if we think about when we should be using biologics, I think we've got to look at guidelines. And I know there are multiple different guidelines available, but I would recommend using GINA. It's updated every six months. It's led by some very sensible, pragmatic clinicians. And if we look at where we think about using biologics, we've got slightly different treatment tracks earlier on at step one and two in particular. But if we focus on step five, we're seeing very early on the use of biologics. So we're thinking about maybe a LAMA, a long antimuscarinic, which is essentially teotropium for severe asthma, but very early on refer for phenotypic assessment and think about all the currently available biologics. And I think very importantly, we should be doing that before we're thinking about macrolides or leukotriene receptor antagonists and definitely before we consider low dose oral corticosteroids and particular, and I'm very pleased Gina have done this, it considers, if you're thinking about adding in low dose OCS, consider adverse events. So we're really clearly seeing biologics being pushed forward in the treatment paradigm to certainly before chronic oral corticosteroids. And there's been a step change in asthma therapies over the last decade. And until 2021, we had five different biologics, essentially three different classes targeting type 2 inflammation. So for the longest period of time, we've had omelizumab targeting IgE. More recently, and this is in chronological order, we've had mepolizumab and resizumab, which block interleukin-5 and therefore target eosinophils. More recently, we've had bemolizumab that actually binds to the R5 receptor alpha on the surface of eosinophils and is eosinophil depleting. And most recently, we've had dupilumab that targets the R4 receptor alpha, and this so has an impact on both R4 and R13. But I think we're now at a point where we have a step change, where we have a new class of biologic, which has just been approved in December of 2020, tezapelumab. And tezapelumab targets one of the epithelial-derived cytokines, the alarmins, uh, TSLP, specifically blocking it from interacting with its receptor. And because it's blocking that upstream epithelial-derived cytokine, it has the potential to inhibit multiple downstream inflammatory pathways and therefore have a much broader impact on airways inflammation. If we look at the studies with tezapelumab, first of all, I'm showing you the Jonathan Corrin's pathway study published back in 2017. And here, this was a dose ranging study. So there are three doses. On the left, we have the placebo arm, and then we have three different doses of tezapelumab. And to orientate you, it's the middle dose, the 210 milligrams every four weeks that's been taken through the phase three and is now licensed. And if we look at asthma exacerbations, we're seeing a, with the licensed dose now a 71% reduction compared with placebo. So a really 
impressive reduction. And I think it was really this graphic that got everyone so excited about tezapalumab, because here we're looking at the impact of tezapalumab and again, the orange is a placebo and you've got the three different doses and the middle blue is a 210 milligram dose, which we've taken forward. You can see this really marked reduction in exacerbations, irrespective of low or high eosinophil counts on the left, low or high nitric oxide levels in the middle, or overall low or high TH2 status on the right-hand side. So really good early evidence that this drug, tezapalumab, by targeting that upstream uh, TSLP can have a, an impact across a very broad patient population. And this has been borne out by Navigator, which is a phase three pivotal study, exacerbation study for tezapalumab using the 210 milligram dose every four weeks. And this was the first figure from the New England Journal publication with a forest plot. And as with every forest plot, we look with the middle and here on the left favors tezapalumab and on the right favors placebo. And in the overall population, you're seeing a positive impact with tezapalumab. And then with subpopulations, you're seeing a positive impact across the board. So I'm just going to call you out to look at some of them. So you can see as with all biologics, the higher the eosinophil count, the bigger the impact. But for the first time with any biologic, we're saying with patients with an eosinophil count, a baseline of less than 150 cells, a positive decrease in the number of exacerbations with tezapalumab. We've not seen that before. And it works irrespective of whether or not people are allergic, right at the bottom. And it works at low pheno levels, works better at higher pheno levels, but it works across the board. And this is the first biologic where we're seeing this decrease in exacerbations, irrespective of the underlying phenotype. So very exciting findings. And then if we look at biomarkers, so here we've looked at the conventional biomarkers that we all tend to try and measure in routine clinical practice. So we're looking on the left at eosinophil counts in the middle at nitric oxide levels and at the right at total Ig. And if we look at the left blood eosinophil counts, you can see that by week two and persisting out to week 52, we're seeing with the blue of tezapelumab a very significant and sustained reduction in the eosinophil count that we're not seeing with the orange of placebo. And in the middle, again, we're seeing this 15 part per billion fall in nitric oxide levels within two weeks with treatment of tezapelumab, which we're not seeing with the orange of placebo. And if we look on the right, at total IgE levels over the 52 weeks of the study with the blue, we're seeing this really ongoing sustained fall in total IgE levels. So all three biomarkers are going down. Bloody eosinophil count and pheno very quickly. IgE, not surprisingly, because the half-life of IgE slower, but that's sustained throughout the 52 weeks of the study. So if we look at other recent study results from Navigator, and this is primarily data that's just hot off the press presented at the Quadruple AI, we looked at the impact of tezapalumab across seasons. So we know there is a seasonality component to exacerbations. We expect viral exacerbations to be more common in the fall and the winter and allergen-induced exacerbations to be more common in spring and summer. And we saw with tezapelumab that it's blocking exacerbations across the whole year. We did a big multinational study for 12 months, so we caught everyone's seasonality. And we can see that tezapelumab is working across all these different triggers, again, sort of feeding into its broad mechanism of action. And in terms of treatment, inking at airway and circulating cytokines, I've just shown you the impact on nitric oxide bloody eosinophils and total IgE, but we also saw an early and significant reduction in interleukin-5 and interleukin-13. And finally, we saw an early and sustained reduction in the weekly percentage of asthma symptomatic days in the tezapelumab treated patients versus placebo. I think it's important to look at other biologics that are currently in development. I'm just going to share two with you now. So one is astigalimab, which blocks ST2. And ST2 is the IL-33 receptor. And if you look on the right here, we've got, it's a dose rate, a relatively early dose ranging study with placebo and orange, and then different doses of astigalimab. In the overall study population, those with lower eosinophil counts of less than 300 or greater than 300, and then less than 150 or greater or equal to 150 eosinophils. And we are seeing some reductions, that's certainly the case. So I presume that this anti-ST2 monoclonal antibody will be going further into drug development. So the other emerging therapy is an actual monoclonal antibody that doesn't block the receptor, but blocks R33 itself, and it's called atipicumab. So here's a study, again, a phase two study, looking at either blocking R33 or blocking gupinumab with a conventional biologic or combining 
blocking L33 in the middle with blocking the L4 receptor alpha. And overall, the primary endpoint was events indicating loss of asthma control during a 12-week intervention period. And you can see overall, there wasn't that much difference. And actually, for some of the outcomes, dupilumab seemed to be more efficacious. I'm not sure what's happening with this biologic, whether or not it's been taken forward, but I'm really pleased that there are multiple biologics in development looking at different alarmins. So now that we've got up to six biologics, the key question is, how do we select a biologic? And I think that's always difficult. And when we've got to that point, and we're confident that we have a patient who has severe asthma, who's adherent with therapy, and we know what we think their endotype is, or we've got our best guess with a biomarker, we treat with a precision medicine approach based on those endotypes and biomarkers. And there are various different ways to do it, and there isn't necessarily a right way, but this is adapted from Roland Bull's article in Jackie in Practice. And here, if we start with a patient with a bloody sample count of less than 150 cells, then we can think about what we can do here with the pheno level. So if we've got less than 150 cells and the pheno is greater than 25 parts per billion, and they've got sensitivity to an inhaled perennial air allergen, we can think about anti-L4-13, so gepilimab, anti-IG, omelizumab, or anti-TSLP, tesapilimab. If they're not sensitized to a perennial air allergen, we can think about either gepilimab or tesapilimab. And on the right, if their nitric oxide levels are less than 25 parts per billion and they have less than 150 eosinophils, if they're sensitized to an inhaled perennial air allergen, think about omelizumab or tesapilimab. But if they don't have that sensitivity, then we can think about anti-TSLP, tesapilimab. If we look at those with a higher blood eosinophil count between 150, but less than 1,500 cells per microliter, then again, we can think about both the blood eosinophil count and the pheno levels. We could try and think about which is a dominant biomarker, but if I'm honest, that's hard to do. And often we only find out at the end of the treatment trial. So if we think it's more of an eosinophilic than a pheno-driven disease, you can see we might think about an anti-L5 or an anti-L5 receptor alpha or anti-TSLP. If we think it's more pheno rather than blood eosinophils, we can think about essentially any of the options, all six of the options there. But if we look at the bottom half, if we think about those comorbidities and those T2 comorbidities, severe atopic dermatitis here, I think there's a good argument for using an anti-L4 receptor alpha because of its proven clinical efficacy in atopic dermatitis. In those patients with chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps at the moment, we have good evidence around the anti-L4 receptor alpha blocker and some evidence around the others. That's not to say that we won't have evidence around TSLP blockade in the future. We just don't have it right now. But again, if it's a more around sensitivities to inhaled perennial allergens, I think, again, you can see here that Roland's suggesting that we can use any of the available agents. I think the most important thing with all of these is remember their treatment trials. And remember, you need to do a very logical, objective assessment at six to 12 months. And if you're not getting a super response, think about switching. So on this slide, we're looking at sort of two extremes. So on the left, we're looking at patients with very high eosinophil levels, so greater than 1,500 cells per microliter. And I think if we see a patient like this, we really need to think, have we got the diagnosis correct? So we need to think, is there another hyper eosinophilic syndrome or a pulmonary eosinophilic syndrome? Has this patient got EGPA or potentially allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis? So we make sure that we're not missing something else. But if they haven't, we've really got to treat that eosinophilia. So we're going to use an anti-L5 or an anti-L5 receptor alpha. And on the right, with OCS-dependent asthma, I think the most important thing is we get them on a biologic and we try and get them off the oral corticosteroids as soon as we can because of that side effect profile. And you can see here from this algorithm that anti-L5 receptor alpha and anti-L5 and anti-L4 receptor alpha are called out because that's where the best study data is. It doesn't mean that we can't use the others, but there's good study data for OCS sparing with these biologics. But I think most important of all, I recognize that there isn't always the right biologic for that person in front of me that I can always tell will work perfectly first time. So we should be practicing shared decision making. So I sit down with my patients and I want to understand what do they want. I set a target that they want and I try and treat to that target and I have a forensic assessment at six and 12 months. And if they're not hitting that target, if I'm not getting a fantastic response, I think about switching. I'm very comfortable with switching. People worry about switching because you might have had a partial response and you're worried about losing that partial response. But in reality, if you lose that partial response, you can always go back to the previous biologic. So don't be afraid to switch. If you're not sure, I would suggest thinking, can I switch to a different class? Can I get a better improvement? And if lose a bit of control, you can always go back to that previous biologic. So in summary, 
I think we've got great evidence and we follow Gina and biologics are clearly indicated at step five and clearly indicated before maintenance at oral corticosteroids. And until very recently, we've had biologics targeting type two inflammation and we've been able to target IgE, eosinophils and anti-L4 and anti-L13. But we now have a step change, first in class novel approach where we can target TSLP and epithelial derived cytokine, which actually inhibits multiple downstream inflammatory pathways and has that broader impact on airways inflammation where we're seeing decreases in eosinophils, nitric oxide levels, as well as IgE, as well as that improvement in asthma exacerbations across that broad biomarker group. And that's tezapalamide targeting TSLP. There are also other emerging therapies, two targeting IL-33, one which blocks IL-33 itself and one which blocks the SD2, the IL-33 receptor. And there's certainly more data to come. So an incredibly exciting area. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the talk. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash MRW860. This activity is supported by an independent educational grant from AstraZeneca LP.